pig has been updated. Ooh. Configure motion. Configure motion. All right. Oh, yeah. Let sure. me know when it's live, and, we'll, and I'll go ahead and Tweedledee. Yeah. By Tweedledee, we I are mean. Live. Oh, we're so live. Are we live? So very live. Buried alive. Buried alive. <laughs> Come on! Diamond Club TV. Uh, went to CJ Johnson's 50th birthday party last night. Watch. Oh, how was it? It was really great. Uh, Bob Sheets performed, and uh, uh, Rebecca Loby performed, and we all. And then I shook, and then all of my windows went away for no reason. Damn it. <laughs> was, yeah. I can never remember which computers I've disabled that on. Uh, yeah, man, it was really badass. Uh, we were up, to, uh, Bonnie and I didn't really get back home until 3.45 in the <coughs> morning. So it was good. Can you guys hear me typing? A little bit. Yeah. Uh, did one of you guys tweet this out yet? Yeah. yeah. All right. <coughs> Whoa, I am getting a bit of an echo. Let me hear let me hear you talk, Andrew. Hi. I'm Andrew Main. <laughs> <laughs> great. <laughs> it's good. It sounds great. All right. And how do you spell that? <laughs> I'm going to go get a Halls pardon me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fine. So how long did you spend working on uh, your new studio setup? This is actually the first day that I've really had at home since I got all this stuff from her like three weeks ago because I had uh, like I, I got all this stuff from Colleen the day the night before I left for Austin. Oh, wow. Uh, oh, that's right. That's since, right. Yeah, yeah. Since then, it was a week in Mexico and then flipping out to Columbus and then flipping out to, I had a week basically in Charlotte and Washington, D.C. So you've been sitting all this stuff but haven't had a chance to play with it at all. So, yeah, it's it's been here at the house. I just haven't, and we finally got a, a table for it the last time I was here. Uh, and now we're setting everything up. And so it's, uh, well, and you know, I got the soundboard working and do you have, do you have wirecast on there or, or do you have not any kind yet. of streaming? No, okay. no, no, no. Right. This is the first thing that, that, that will ever, ever have been streamed off this, uh, this whole thing. Right it on. It is a monumental achievement. It looks really good. It looks really good and, and clean and smooth and well shaven. Shorn. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's every follicle will be documented every sexy follicle uh all right let me let me hear andrew and i think we're ready to go if you could recreate that awesome name again hi <laughs> uh, my name's andrew main <laughs> all right uh yeah man off coming on but i'm not gonna give you i think i think I th all right i'm ready to go whatever you say all right hold on all right shutting down my twitter after i all right i'm good to go Three, two. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Mr. Justin Robert Young. Yeah! And Brian Brushwood. Wah! I just assume we're both doing our uh, Godzilla impressions. Is that what it is? Sure. Yeah, yeah why not? 
We're Gentlemen. We're certainly not getting paid for in theaters now. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. Full disclosure, we want you to not watch it so that uh, our team wins in the movie draft. <laughs> uh, I, I recommend you pay for another movie, but still go see it. Cause... Yeah. <laughs> um, gentlemen, you know, you know what's great is camping. You know, the great outdoors. Yeah. You know. It's all American, right? It's what this yeah. country manifest destiny. We, you, that's what I think of when we go camping. Is that yeah, it? Go. Yeah, you think about rolling, rolling westward because God told you to. Well, yeah, or... take it, take it. Like every time I'd see a tree leaf uh, on the ground, I'm like, "That's mine to burn," and then I burn it because it's yeah. like it's all mine. I mean, like you got you got the historic traditions, like you pointed out. There's you know sitting around a campfire, roasting marshmallows, mm. telling stories, getting yep. dragged into the woods and covered in blood. <laughs> yeah, no, he's all. Wait. Well, I mean, the last one just uh, that doesn't match my experience. There's, I mean, you know, all the outdoor activities, you know, hanging with friends. Yeah. Going through a lake of blood, looking uh -huh. for just, uh, again. It's it's uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this a Florida thing? Because you guys both seem on board with all the blood and the covering and the. I mean, listen, Brian. Uh, nature is a many splendored thing. Uh, <laughs> you don't. You can't just walk around life saying, "Ooh, that's gross." Like, where's that gonna you know, get you? So among like, <laughs> you know, like the get-togethers, the the songs and and the talent shows, and then being dragged and tied to a tree and tortured. Um, you know, <laughs> yep. <laughs> By the way, that, that, that does remind me that uh, Tucker and Dale versus Evil 2 has been greenlit. But uh, aside from that, I, 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 I'm disturbed by this focus on the blood and the torture, Andrew. Um, I mean, it's not all blood and torture. Uh, I mean, <laughs> it's it, also whittling. <laughs> yeah, uh, it could be scavenger hunts, you know, where you have to find items to save your life. What um, is this story? Did this happen to someone? This is somebody's existence? Brian, this is going to be my existence June 7th when I go to the Great Horror Camp Out. No what? way! Are you kidding me? Have you heard of this? This Okay, first of all, this sounds like a setup for a slasher movie <laughs> where it's like, it's a hilarious adventure where you get to pretend to get murdered. And you're like, oh, the murders are real. So there's a thing called the Great Horror Camp Out, and I'd heard about it a year ago, and some friends went, and it sounded awesome. And there's something really awesome I'll tell you guys about in a second if you find it. Oh, dude, look, they got music and everything. They got ambient here. Go ahead. Talk to me about it while we hear the... the you, you, you see some creepy guy holding an axe, staring at some people who are delightfully enjoying their camp out. So you show up there. This is going to be the old L.A. Zoo, right? <laughs> the abandoned zoo. What could be better? Now, what happens is you show up there at 8 p.m., and it goes all night till 8 a.m. And they can drag you from your tent. They can put you through their horror zones. There are creatures on the loose. You get your dossier of things you're supposed to do. There's a scavenger hunt, a hell hunt. Um, oh, my God. This sounds amazing. So this is like a more uh, intense version of like like Halloween Horror Nights or something like that. Yeah, you right? actually have a tent that you, you, you can try to sleep in. You bring your sleeping bag. So it's, it's an actual camp out. So well, okay. actually, would you guys do this if it came near you? Oh, hell's yes. In a in a heartbeat. Click, click pick a city. Oh, no, 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 no. Hold on. Let me let me let me get back. Uh, there we go. Come on. Big money. No whammy. Let's, let's see where this is coming to. Los Angeles. Austin, Texas. Ah. <laughs> and uh, and it's, right after that, San Francisco, California, the Alameda Fairgrounds in Pleasanton, California. Oh, my God. Okay, so there has to be all this kind of code of conduct. Uh, first of all, kudos to you, Andrew, for keeping this under your hat. I don't understand how you didn't call us instantly to share this with us. Uh, but I would imagine there has to be some kind of big like code of conduct for it. Like Everyone has to know their role for it to be fun. I'm looking at the safety in terms now. It says, uh, read, read the safety in the terms. All right, here we go. It says the great horror camp out is frightening. It may include total darkness, water spray and splash, uneven surfaces, steps up and down, strobe lighting, latex, <laughs> narrow tunnels, crouch spaces, which require you to bend down while walking, sudden loud noises, live characters, fog and scent effects, which are all intended to startle and frighten you. 
The great horror camp out is not recommended for people with heart or back problems, pregnant women, women or people prone to seizures or anyone who has an affliction that is made worse by fear, anxiety or flashing lights. Also, this event is not recommended for anyone with health issues. Uh, during the great horror camp out, you may be forcibly handled, moved, bound, hooded, chained and subjected to simulated torture <laughs> by our actors. You may witness strong verbal content, which may be considered offensive in nature. This content is part of the experience and presented for entertainment purposes only. So here are the big differences is not only is this an all, uh, you know, an immersive experience compared to haunted house stuff or, or even big scale haunted house stuff like, like Halloween Horror Nights. But also the big thing at, at a lot of those is no touching, right? Yeah, like yeah. people can't touch you in this. Uh, the gloves are off, so to speak. Uh, my favorite here is uh, the <laughs> don't bring anything of value. We will not be held liable for the loss of any item. Participation is an individual experience. It will not be the same for all campers as campers will participate in the activities of their choice. Great horror camp out is fur free. We have enough <laughs> blood and guts at the camps. Please don't wear fur. <laughs> Big stance, big stance by the great horror camp out. Campers sleep in four person tents. If you come alone or as the extra person in any group of uneven number, you may be paired with another camper to tent uh, share. If you'd prefer not to, please ensure you book four tickets to secure an entire tent. We supply tents, a buffet style dinner, a continental breakfast, marshmallows for roasting, hell hunt reusable bag, and a wristband to be worn to identify your tent grouping. We do not supply sleeping bag pillows, flashlights, or drinks. You must bring these yourself. Semi and total darkness is used throughout the experience. Therefore, running is forbidden. That's smart. Uh, great horror camp out operates rain or shine. Oh, how much better would it be? Freaking miserable and rain out there. You I mean, <laughs> I don't know, guys. I don't know if uh, like this is. I'm kind of a. I'm kind of a scaredy cat. When it Are comes you, to this stuff. Uh, no open flames of any kind. That's a bummer. If you appear to be under the influence of alcohol, we resume. Oh, well, that's a bummer. Uh, this is getting less cool, guys. <laughs> well, I think this is just that that's there. We we can kick you out because you're too drunk. Yeah, there's ample time for sleeping. However, the event and scare activity will continue throughout the entire 12 hours sporadically and without warning. You may experience erratic interruptions during your sleep and at other points during the night. Oh my God, that's amazing! How would you find this out, Andrew? I don't know. I, I I was thinking something popped up in my RSS feed, and I think I think our friend Katie Dirks did this at one point. Really? Mm-hmm. And I'll so have to, uh, I'll have to ask her about that. I mean, another example of uh, how much more of a man Katie Dirks is than I am. That I'm, <laughs> that she has already done it, and I'm wishy-washy about being too scared. <laughs> oh well, there God. is there is a safe word. Is there? Yeah, if you say, like, I want my mommy. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I want my money back. <laughs> it's like, I won't pay you. I won't pay you. And they're like, whoa. No, they're, they're adamant. Once you step foot in there, you're, uh, you're not getting your money back. But, like, it's I want my mommy is your safe word. That's amazing. Uh, all right. So the vocabulary, you have to get to know the vocabulary for the hell hunt. You have hell zones, which are the main areas of the hunt where most skag resides. Is skag like, I guess, well, we'll find out what skag is. Um, skag is S word campers all get. These are items for which you will be hunting. A list of all skag will be found in your dossier. These are items that will be of value should you be Hellmaster. The ultimate in prestige, the ultimate prize, the status of all campers seek, but only few will achieve. Upon being crowned a Hellmaster, you will receive a sash, an official patch that you will affix to the sash. When wearing that sash at a future campout, you'll have access to VIP lounge areas, first access to purchase tents. Oh my God, this is amazing. Crowd bursts, so, uh, speed yeah, bumps. So this is only if, if you complete it, then you will get these, uh, these special perks, right? Yeah, it sounds like this is all your second lap thing. And it looks, I guess that makes sense because on the cities, it, it shows like two nights per place. So maybe it's a two, you come back the second night all bedraggled and, and battle worn, and you get oh, to be so the this hellmaster. It's more like if you decide to go to other, other locations or other places. Dude, this is, you think that, that, that this has a whole group like following the Grateful Dead? So, like, so uh, uh, just Brian, scroll up to uh, to the cities there. All right, like just to give everybody a sense, this is mainly West Coast uh, yeah, and they Texas. Have, if you win, you get like access to VIP section at future. 
Oh, so like once you're in, you're in the club and you and you're always a badass and get to do whatever. So we got uh, Los Angeles, Houston, Austin, San Francisco, Sacramento, Seattle, Portland, San Diego, and uh, they have they have a two person tent, a four person tent, and chicken zone, uh, which is which is only admission to the safe area. Oh, look at that! So it's gonna run you uh, in a four person tent. It's one hundred and thirty nine dollars a person, and two person tent. It's two hundred and three dollars a person, man. I'll swear, dude. And and they, they've got stuff for uh for like media contacts, right? You have to get if you can get approval for the media. What if we were to do a live like the three of us and get get like Brett the Amtrek around Seville to join us, so we could do a four person tent and record that stuff live all night. Maybe live stream it all night long. Oh man. I'll tell you what. <laughs> How amazing would that be? Like real life Blair Witch? That'd be awesome. Uh dude, I'm getting a little getting a little weirded out just even <laughs> thinking about it. Oh my god, I would love it. We tell ghost stories and then one of us would get killed. And then yeah. we were like, well, them's the breaks. So uh, man, I'm I'm excited. I mean, I have so many mixed emotions. <laughs> <laughs> You love it in theory, but then you realize that as you can reach out, you can almost touch it, and you realize it's burning with a white hot fire, and it doesn't seem like such a good idea. I mean, it's it's just I I do I get a little nervous <laughs> with these things. <laughs> I just get a little like even like Halloween Horror Nights. It's like I I I, I love it for, and what I would love about this is kind of how they put it together because it looks like they very much. You know, they they care a lot about this immersive experience. Like I would love it as an immersive experience, uh, but I, I am not I've never really been like a fan of horror movies, like for the scare elements of it. Like I, I was always the kid that was like, hey, do we have to watch The Shining? Like when I was a kid, <laughs> like it is uh, it is definitely not exactly my wheelhouse. But but if we all did it, I don't think I'd have a choice. So the whole thing like it's the fact that it's actually a competition uh maybe this will soften the blow for you justin because it says yeah. here in the hell hunt vocabulary like speed bumps is are the challenges that can leave you kidnapped cage or trunked using your and using your highly coveted skag items to barter your way out crowd bursts justin the yeah. camp headmaster isn't going to crown you a hellmaster easily you'll need to prove you're made from the right stuff by making it through a tournament style blood tag match camp talent show or by simply mislistening to important rule changes that could disqualify hundreds in one i think they mean fell swoop but they wrote fail swoop which i like even better uh so that this is to basically like if you can if you can get to like these are all how they determine that that the hell masters are the the legit you know one percent of the one percent yeah man come on yeah you, how we, long has this been going on I think it's been going on for a couple of years. I know it was uh, Mark Cuban's one of the investors in it after they were on uh, Shark Tank. Um, ah, man, that's great. I wonder. I gotta wonder. I mean, it sounds like it's a liability nightmare on the surface, but but then again, so does summer camp. So yeah, so does a mud run. <laughs> yeah, or or like like the tough mudder where they have electrified ropes for you to swing and climb and all that stuff. Uh, you know. I mean, th these kind of immersive experiences, I mean, especially they're huge out here in San Francisco. Like there are a couple companies that do uh, like I forget if it, it was like, like, like the impossible room or something like that, where you just got it was you and a group of people and you were just led into a room and everything you needed to continue this journey was in there. And it was a timed element that like each little clue that you solved, you got added on. And yeah. the idea was to make it out of the room. And it's like there's no guarantee that you are going to get out. And so people would just go and come back and go and come back. And it was like this really long experience. A, a friend of mine at the Go Game put together a Logan's Run uh, immersive experience for his, uh, his, his 30th birthday. So like these are, these are definitely kind of uh, all the rage uh, you know, these days, especially up here in San Francisco. And that's so great. I'm looking at, uh, looking at my calendar for late June. I don't know. If, uh, if there's no conflicts, it's going to be tough for me to not want to do this. I'm terrified. I'm yeah. terrified just even thinking about it. Oh, right. 
<laughs> I like. I, like yeah, now, and, you, and, now, now, tell me this. Tell me this. Do you think that you might derive as a source of strength? Like, is there a difference in your mind between the experience of us just doing it and the experience of us doing it and you knowing for a fact there's a 24 hour live stream happening and that at all times you have 300 people watching? Like, does that I, change? At least it? then I could focus on being funny. Right. Like, I, I, my, the biggest terror for me would just be like me and Ashley by ourselves doing this. Oh, Bonnie because, would like, never do this. Yeah. Because then it would just be like me emasculating myself as a screaming, <laughs> uh, you know, five year old. Just shouting, take her, take her over and I over want and over all again. All of our mommies. <laughs> well, this was, a, this was a test for a girl I've been seeing because I, I, I bought tickets. I bought two tickets for a two person tent and then I sent her the description and I said, You're, Are you in? And then she writes back, uh, she's like, I couldn't sleep for the last hour. All I could do was think about this. It sounds so exciting. <laughs> so, oh, wow. You're in. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Congratulations. Wow. That's a she keeper. Passed the great horror <laughs> camp out test. Yeah. A, a tried and uh, true method. To oh, my God. How many, think about this. Think about how many people are getting freaky. Like, this seriously turns them on. And then they, they go to grab oh. some people and there's wrestling inside the tent. I could not imagine anything more more horrifying than trying to get freaky in the middle of this the I LA, mean, I, old I, LA I, zoo surrounded by a bunch of horror fiends. That's because uh, you and I are fairly well-adjusted individuals, but I would imagine <laughs> not everyone at this event is. I, I, I For I, my experience, I'm sure this would be a very chaste <laughs> experience. Uh, oh, sure, sure. <laughs> Nothing like the threat of constantly being abducted and having a hood thrown over my oh head my to God. kill any sort of romantic <laughs> mood. But, I mean, listen, uh, this, is, this is the horror trope, though. Like, you know, I'm sure that they're like they're waiting to, to hear the, 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 the tent for which boots are knocking so they can run up, you know, some crazy hillbilly drenched in blood to <laughs> yank them <laughs> off each other. <laughs> Man, I uh, got I gotta believe so many people will get busy just because that's part that's the whole like think about it. That, that's gotta be for some people, uh you know, their their fantasy. Like they're in cabin in the woods. Right I mean, listen, that. like you read through all those things that you can't do. And like <laughs> you you think bio mission it drunk, spells out? <laughs> being drunk was intent. spelled out that they have a right to kick you out, but they did say don't bang each other. Yeah. Um so I got my tickets, guys. Coming to your city soon. All right, let's do let's before we wrap this up. Uh, let's look at tips for your stay because I think that's interesting. Uh, sleeping bag, pillow, flashlight, dossier, old white T-shirt. If you're playing blood tag, which I got to, you think that's like paint, uh, paintball or something? Plain and clean, it will get ruined. Not necessary, but recommended. Oh Jesus, a snorkel mask, an underwater flashlight. <laughs> A few changes of underwear, a change of clothes, a snuggle bear and blankie, bathing suit, towel, water, and sna snacks. Welcome to camp. Good That's God. Everybody. It's All brilliant. right. It's brilliant. So in light of uh, Godzilla being out in theaters, I, I, I saw it and uh, we'll talk about it. We do the picks, but I went home and. Of course, like any nine-year-old kid, I got obsessed with dinosaurs and trying to find out what was the biggest dinosaur ever. And uh, two days later, all of a sudden, a day later, we get press releases talking about scientists think they've identified the largest dinosaur ever. You like big uh, dinosaurs? Oh, my I, God. And uh, Have you already seen the photos on this, Justin? No, I have not. Okay, so uh, there is a famous photo. I'm going to see if I can pull it up here. And it is a, we'll say, probably average-sized technician human being laying down uh, next to what, what is believed to be the femur of this dinosaur. Okay. What do you suppose the size relation is? Let's go ahead and peg him as, like, six feet long. Uh, I'm going to say he is a third the size. So you say the bone is three times the size. Let me take a look here. I got a picture here. Man, that's uh, that's a, maybe a bit optimistic. It looks here. Oh, good God! It's it's a fifty percent again as tall. So this is like a ten foot long femur of <laughs> the unnamed behemoth. Good Lord, that's gigantic. So as yet unnamed behemoth weighed how much? You roll that up a little bit, Brian. Uh, it says here. Uh, 77 tons, seven stories tall, 77 tons. Hey, Andrew, do you, have you read this? Do you know if it's uh, if it's one that um, 
that uh, like a plant eater, I assume, like a, one of them diplodocuses. Uh, yeah. I mean, they, anything that big is, is going to be a, a plant eater. Um, and, and that's there. There's reasons for thinking why plant eaters would get that big. Um, so this guy's bigger than all of these. So like this one, this one, uh, uh, we're looking at a comparison of a few different uh, um, Amphiocelius fragilimus. Man, Mrs. Hershers, then Cadora. So, like, like Argentinosaurus <laughs> had been the biggest one, and then now they have, you know, this. Man, I love this photo because the for reference, the dude's like, "Hi, I know oh, well, nothing." There yeah. is like so the 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 title Titanosaurus came from uh, a guy by the name of uh, Leidecker back in 1877 because he's found some fragments of stuff that's not enough to reassemble a whole dinosaur, but this was one of the first ones we look at and like, this thing could be big, really, really big, much, much bigger than, you know, what we used to call the Brontosaurus. And I sent you a graphic that shows you the different sizes of, you know, what like uh, sauropods, the different, you know, going all the way up, Argentinosaurus, and then the uh, Amphiclelis, which is like the biggest one yet. And it's massive. I mean, it's I, I I can't even. It almost breaks my brain. In fact, that that was. And we'll talk about it at picks. But that was almost one of uh, one of my complaints about Godzilla was it was so big that I lost my sense of scale and couldn't. I felt like I couldn't get appropriately amazed at how big it is. And now we're looking at uh, the real critter here. Decidedly, you know, but I'll tell you, a, a creature that kind of doesn't get as much love. Uh, the largest land mammal ever. Uh, that's not the woolly mammoth? No, the Paracerotherium. I assume Paracerotherium. You, you have that look in your eye like you're about to send me a link. Should I try to find it or are you going to send it over? Well, uh, uh, there we go. You spelled it for me. That's all I ask. Right. Uh, all right. So a Paracerotherium is being looked up right now. What, can you describe it for us? Um, imagine a rhino had sex with a giraffe. Whoa. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, it does look at Jesus. A, look at that. Bigger, bigger. They, they show it next to a, a, a full-size uh, uh, oh my step God. mammoth. This and, thing. All right. So, yeah, no, it, it does. It looks like a rhino uh, mixed with a giraffe, but that that is a terrifying creature. You unleash a couple of those, like you could you could. Tear down a city, kind of like a kind of like a bird beak too. It looks like it's got on there. And what's interesting about Paracerotherium is it didn't go extinct um, because of man. No, yeah, it was. Uh, By the way, for, for for reference, it's, uh, it shows a uh, average human is almost two meters tall. This thing was five meters tall, eight meters long. It looks like you could probably pack, maybe if you were doing a contest, fifteen, possibly twenty humans on top of this thing, and um, it looks like it can walk fact, comfortably. It inspired the ad at from Empire Strikes Back. What? Yep. So, and I guess that that solves the question because I found out I was sad to find out that it was an urban legend that it was the forklifts at the um, uh, at the Oakland docks that inspired the ad ats. Uh, apparently that's that's been debunked, and I guess this is the true story. Yeah, the uh, the Paracerotheriums at the Oakland Docks were the ones that inspired. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They've got some mock-ups here from some uh, from some museums. Wow. Why do you think this man? I'll say this dude needs to fire his agent because like he has <laughs> they, he gets no play. Nobody remembers this guy, and he was a badass. You know, yeah. it, it it reminds me of the I don't know the big rhino looking things from Avatar. Like I could see these things yeah. storming out of the forest and, and it, do, it does man. like it, it looks like 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 a, like a, a vaguely alien kind of thing. Like it would be something that that you would see in 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 Avatar or another science fiction. Wait, film. And, Why do you think that these just kind of fall down the memory hole for you know that we we get so fascinated by these other elements well, did, of of dinosaurs did we hunt them to extinction i, I heard uh, oh, did you know they went they, they they left long before us but you had other things that were around when we were like giant sloth and other creatures that were just humongous you know that for most most of human history or most of you know, the time the humans have been on planet there have been these really massive mammals that only you know died off 
you know, 20, you know, to 10,000 years ago. Man, that's a beast. Do you think, uh, man, I just want to see an epic battle royale of all of the different epochs, best and brightest fighting. Yeah. Like, I think before we'd have a Jurassic Park, we would have a, you know, ancient mammal park. Well, and plus yeah. also those would be more likely to, to have a, 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 the premise of Jurassic Park, of course, being that they were able to reconstitute DNA. We get mm -hmm. much better samples and that we have woolly mammoth hair and uh, and theoretically some frozen ovums that, that we could extract because uh, I, I, there was a plan described at some point where you could take mammoth DNA, put it in a uh, an elephant egg and uh, grow a kind of elephant mammoth hybrid. And then with that offspring, you could put more uh, mammoth DNA into that one. So then it gets pretty much like 90% of what we think a mammoth is based on that was, was what I'd read was their kooky plan. That seems more believable than, you know, certainly reconstituting fossilized DNA for a, uh, you know, for a dinosaur. Yeah, and I we there's an article I have on weird things that kind of goes into. There was a announcement a while back that we would not be able to recover DNA beyond a certain point, which they said, ah, oh, we'll never be able to you know get dinosaur DNA. And 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 in, in science, you never want to say never. We we because and now we're finding that we may be able to get DNA much much older than we thought because yeah, those conditions normally would break down. But anyhow, if we wanted to have a T Rex today. You wouldn't want to have an exact copy of a T-Rex because he'd be wheezing all the time. The oxygen content in the atmosphere is very different. His diet's different. And you would be having to tamper with him genetically anyways to make him live. And, you know, we could just build something that looked like a T-Rex based on the morphology of it. And, you know, as you talked with the mammal stuff, if you wanted to, like, let's let's start with Parasterotherium. You know, let's, let's, let's build some awesome mammals, giant sloth. Something that's at least built to survive in this environment, because that's the biggest thing, is that's, that's the reason, if I understand correctly, that not only dinosaurs were so big, but also like, you know, three foot wide dragonflies and all that stuff. Like, that's not possible to do, not because our bugs are, are weaklings nowadays, which they are, for the record, but because they're just yeah, simply, because, because like, like insects don't have lungs, so it's like they just, in order to get that big, they needed to be able to access that much oxygen. There's what, like three times as much oxygen back in the day? Yeah, it was a lot lot warmer, a lot more oxygen, much higher CO2 also. So, I mean, it's a very, it, it's interesting because we start thinking about life on other planets is that you look at how much our planet has changed through the millions of years and how, you know, we would find that we'd say, yeah, this is Earth-like, but this is so much different than what we consider Earth-like, but you have to go Earth-like in what period? All right. Pop quiz, largest yeah. animal ever. Uh, blue whale. Ding, ding. There you go. Oh, Still wait. the king. Yes. See, now, and that surprises me. I want, is that because the, uh, the sea environment is relatively unchanged and, and that it's just farther down the... Okay, I, you're shaking there, your head. There you? were, remember, there were massive reptiles and other creatures that lived in the sea that, that you know... So, you know, after like, you know, the kind of the bet, you know, I think that I think it certainly they were protected more from like were able to migrate when the ice ages came about for that's for sure. But, yeah. you know, you look at some of the just the uh, the prehistoric reptilian creatures that lived in the ocean and any things like Megalodon, this super huge, gigantic shark that would like eat great white sharks. So, man, Jesus. You know, but yeah, blue whale just is very, very well optimized for its environment. I mean, okay, look, if you could snap your fingers and we could have back the, uh, what's this guy called? The, uh, the Parasitherium. If we could have back Parasitherium and all you had to do is trade blue whales, like blue whales instantly extinct, Parasitherium back uh, uh, roving across the North American plains, would you do it? Uh, you know what? I'm, I'm excited about getting blue whales back to their ex the levels they were before. I mean, there's maybe like five to 10,000 of them right now in the world. And there used to be probably a quarter million of them before we started whaling. Wow. And, and you think about like, you would see blue whales all the time when you went out to sea. Good it's a, God. It's a good dodge. <laughs> <laughs> very, like very politic. Whale, man. It's, a big, it's the biggest thing ever, man. It's the biggest thing ever. I'll tell you what, that is, that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big deal. That's the definition of a big deal. <laughs> biggest deal. Ah, uh, so yeah, you know what this reminds me of, and I, I don't know. I guess we'll save it for picks. Um, I, I did read, I read Lucky Planet, 
that's there's a little spoiler preview of what we'll talk about in picks because we talked about that last week. Cool. Yeah. All right. So, io9 had an article on a very interesting guy, somebody who I knew nothing about, mm-hmm. Fritz Zwicky. All right. Fritz Zwicky, he was originally from Bulgaria, but was a Swiss citizen. He then came to the United States and was at California Institute of Technology. He was one of these outside thinkers, just some really, really crazy ideas that eventually people came on to go, you know what? Then maybe there's something to it. Looking at the masses of galaxies, he's like, man, there's something going on there. These things got to be bigger than we think or more. There's got to be some sort of matter that's sort of dark that we can't see. And he was the guy that came up with the idea of dark matter, supernova. Oh, wow. Also, a very, very interesting thinker. He had this idea of something called the TerraJet, which was some way for digging massive tunnels underneath the Earth. And he had these ideas on how we should be, you know, just colonizing the entire solar system. And he talked about using nuclear bombs to move Venus into a much more stable orbit. You know, we've talked about this before. Dude, I'm in love with this guy already. Are you kidding me? All right. Now, now, you, you think you're in love with this guy now? Wait till I get to this, right? Um, so he invented the great horror camp out. <laughs> he probably could have. He talked about the idea that, you know, to explain solar eruptions, he came up with the idea of, uh, he called them nuclear goblins, which was a body of nuclear density, density only stable under sufficient external pressure. And then at some point it could move to a star and explode violently, explode violently when it got to the sun's star surface. Still hasn't caught on, but... It's not to say that it isn't. Well, plus, I mean, look, he's instantly a friend of the show because he has goblins in it. Yes. That's like the, the shortcut to our heart. All right. So my two favorite stories here, okay? All so right. they're out Mount Wilson Observatory, and the turbulence, turbulence with, with telescope is one of the biggest problems because you're trying to see through all this atmosphere. And one of the things that we eventually learned to do is we'd shoot a laser beam out there, and we could measure the turbulence in the atmosphere, and then use that to correct digitally the information coming back. And that's also the way DSL works, by the way, is DSL sends a signal through the copper line, listens to all of the, you know, the, listens to the interference, and then cancels that out. He had a better solution. Well, not a better. He had a more immediate solution. They're out there at the telescope, and they're trying to see the stars. And there's too much turbulence. He says, you know what? Why don't you shoot a goddamn gun? And he has an assistant to just aim a gun along the path and try to shoot a bullet through the air to see if the bullet would. It didn't work, but. But that's uh, freaking awesome. To be, yeah, look, he's like, hey, Adam, shoot it through that. There are no uh, bad answers in brainstorming, right? You're right? just spitballing here. All right, now choke me. Come on. Right, you never know. It might work. <laughs> okay, check this out. Um. He was also very proud of his work in producing the first artificial meteors. He placed explosive charges in the nose cone of a V-2 rocket to be detonated at a high altitude and fire high-velocity pellets of metal through the atmosphere. The first attempts appeared to be failures, and Zwicky sought to try again with the Aerobe rocket. His requests were denied until the Soviet Union launched Sputnik 1. Twelve days later, on October 16, 1957, Zwicky launched his experiment on the Aerobe, successfully fired pellets visible from the Mount Palomar Observatory. Again, so what he's doing is he's creating artificial meteors. He's, he's shooting these, these, these pellets way up in the atmosphere till they come back down and they burn up and cause, you know, meteor showers. Now, here's where it gets cool. It's thought that one of these pellets may have escaped the gravitational pull of the Earth and become the first object launched into solar orbit. Wow. What? Now, Wait, remember, when was, when was this again? Yeah, give, me, give me a time frame of when this dude was, was kicking around. That was, he was, that was 1957. Uh, yeah, so if it was a V2 rocket, that, I mean, so this would predate, theoretically, it may have beaten Sputnik and created the first artificial satellite. No, no, I mean, this, he did this 12 days after. Oh, after Sputnik. Sputnik. Got it, yeah. got it, got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so remember, we've talked about here Operation Plum Bomb, which happened uh, in... Uh, we may have we may have actually put the first, which was before Sputnik, which was where we were testing nuclear bombs. And one of the things we did is we had a big silt, we had a big hole in the ground, we had a bomb in there, and we had like a big metal plunger type thing on top of there that may have reached escape velocity and have left the Earth orbit prior to Sputnik. And you know we can calculate to see how far out this thing would have been going. But, wow. Uh, this guy, I, I mean, I, I forget which book I'd read where they talked about his work, but uh, uh, looking at his Wikipedia here, he uh, uh, 
promoted the first use of Schmidt telescopes used in a mountaintop observatory. He did a bunch of stuff on supernovae, neutron stars. Uh, he was the, okay, no, 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 wait, that was his colleague proposed using a supernova as a standard ca candle in order to estimate distances. Uh, gravitational lenses, he posited that gal galaxy clusters could act as, as them. Previously discovered Einstein effect. This guy's the jam, man. Uh, yeah. Not only that, so I just typed into Google this man's name, Fritz Zwicky, uh, and the third autocomplete was insults. What? Oh, yeah, he had a very sharp wit. <laughs> um, so uh, apparently his famous... Uh, 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 so Zwicky, the uh, astrophysical swashbuckler who named the supernova, the dark matter, charted galaxy clusters uh, and launched. Here we go. I accidentally skipped it back. I uh, launched the first inter interplanetary ball bearing. Zwicky, who claimed his morphological method was the greatest contribution to human thought since Pascal, which by the like, way, way to call your own number on that one, Fritz. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, Zwicky at age 72. A terrifying spectacle for a fledgling graduate student who maybe ought to be studying the sun instead of Zwicky's own subject, the supernova, was tall and gone. His speech was intimidating. He began to talk to me briefly each day. Anyway, so here, here is the big quote. Uh, the spherical bastards threw me off the 200 goddamn inch telescope, he fumed, made of a special rule. No observing uh, after the age of 70. Grr, them I could crush. <laughs> oh, my and God. <laughs> Apparently, he was fond of using the term spherical bastard, which was meant to mean that somebody was a bastard no matter how you looked at them. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. When your insults go over people's heads and you just don't even care. It's like, what a waste. <laughs> the spherical bastard. That guy is awesome. Fritz Swicky, man. Hero. One more story. A venture capital firm... Uh, Deep Knowledge Ventures, which is based in Hong Kong, has added a new board member that's going to be uh, uh, weighing in advice and suggestions on investments. Oh, uh, that doesn't sound too weird. People get in, you get in new blood, out with the old, you know, well, shake we, things up. We've talked about one of the problems in the tech industry, or not we haven't, but it's one of the things addressed, is there's, there's, a, there's an underrepresentation of, of, of women, for instance, in tech and certain minority groups and this group has decided to uh this board has decided to put somebody on the board to sort of perhaps uh balance this out but not because of the just the purpose of balancing out they think this per this this is going to bring some really really good insight to the board of directors any any idea any idea what we're talking about here elon musk close really okay um hans zimmer the famous Tony composer Stark. <laughs> Um, well, uh, their name's Vital, and, uh, and Vital is actually a, uh, acronym for Validating Investment Tool for Advancing Life Sciences. Oh my god, it's a robot on the board? A machine learning program has been put on the board, so they say it's going to be given equal weight at the other members as far as investment suggestions. It pours over massive data sets and applies machine learning to predict which life science companies will make successful investments. You know, this is something that they talk about in abundance, which I told you I reread recently. Uh, he talks about how uh, he has a whole chapter on IBM's Watson and about how it was designed in order to, uh, you know, to, to, to parse natural language and access its, its vast library. Uh, Watson did not have access to the Internet. It had to have all of its files locally. Um, and in fact, there was a big debate about whether the question writers would actually try to game the, uh, the questions in, and cr essentially make the game a de facto Turing test, which they thought would be unfair because it's supposed to be judging its knowledge. Uh, and in abundance, he talks about how once they get this thing figured out and, and accessible to, you know, from anyone or, or from anyone to the cloud, all of a sudden you have a personal doctor you basically they're sending watson to medical school and all of a sudden everyone in the third world i mean no it's not the perfect thing it's not the perfect harvard graduate you'd like to be there but all of a sudden just with a snap of the fingers everybody can have a natural language conversation about their symptoms and get valid medical advice that statistically will rank you know very likely as good as going to uh, your local doctor certainly better than you know your local witch doctor mm-hmm 
That's uh, they've done in, in previous experience too on diagnosing. They find out that algorithms are better than doctors at doing these things, and we 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 have this plea to yeah, but the human quality, the human and the human quality is great when you have self doubt, when you have internal skepticism, and you do that. And unfortunately, that is really really lacking. And and if you have that, then you would embrace these tools, and you'd figure out the you know one of the best solutions would be. You know, it would be a human plus this tool, and a human that knows enough to know, like, oh yeah, this this thing's probably right, and I'm not going to go with my gut because my gut's based on bias, or maybe it's overseeing, that, overlooking this, and let me articulate that. And the way forward is these kinds of tools and knowing how to communicate with them and use them. Yeah, I got to tell you, it's uh, the trade-off. Like, you know, yeah, yes, there may be misdiagnoses, and yes, it will won't be a perfect picture in this kind of thing. But the trade-off for all of a sudden massive orders of magnitude multiple you know thousands of orders of magnitude of of more samples to give the most accurate picture of health ever because that's the other thing is is if everybody's using watson dr watson to describe their symptoms dr watson could be the one to figure out like wow that's eight flu-like symptoms in the last 47 hours in this tribe uh let me forward this over to the cdc automatically like it's amazing to me that we talk about oh in the future you know, we watch movies like her wondering like what will be that that be like someday and and that's no 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 bs we're already there man mm -hmm. and we need you know we need, need these things we've we found all the low-hanging fruit for most things like antibiotic you know we have a big we have a big antibiotic problem that you know antibiotics are designed to kill bacteria and get bacteria are evolved to survive and we're you know, evolving strains of bacteria that are antibacterial resistant antibiotic resistant and it's, you know, when people go, oh, well, the pharmaceutical companies, they should just, you know, they're, they're greedy. They won't do this. It's like, no, we found the easy solvable problems. We found the easy things in our environment that we can use. Probably most of them is antibiotics. Now the, the harder problems, the much more harder complex solutions to, pro you know, to solve these problems need complex problem solving devices like computers and stuff. And if we want to solve these things, then, you know, we need to resort to computation because we're going up against hundreds of millions, a billion years of evolution that's designed to wipe away things when it decides that they're irrelevant and we've got to use the best tools we have in order to fight this battle well and that's one of those things like the old generation likes to gripe about how well, kids today always staring at their screens sitting in their rooms why don't you go out and it's like from from a healthcare perspective it's like it's pretty great that we're not you know yeah. rubbing all our germs on each other living in our own filth and all this stuff it's great that we're all in our hermetically sealed individual homes and that we're able to telecommute i mean think about this you know 30 years ago if you said nobody come in to work do not leave your house do whatever you can from home i mean what could you do you're like i can't operate a steel mill from home whereas yeah. now it's just like oh uh, yeah i could pretty well administer most of the robots from home like like the the progress of human uh, you know, the, the engine of human progress doesn't have to grind to a stop, a stop just, you know, because we're all taking care of ourselves and, 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 uh, I don't know, yeah, being sanitary. And, there, and there's, a, there's sort of an evolution of, uh, work moving from literally running around your environment, trying to hunt down things in your environment to then creating a version of your environment, i.e. horticulture and then farming that serves your needs and then moving to the point where your environment becomes managing information and going from the hunter gatherer to the knowledge worker and there are trade-offs there but the advantages far exceed the downsides in my opinion that's crazy so ready for picks 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 uh i assume we'll talk about godzilla here shortly right andrew yes okay before we do, though, I do want to uh, just chime in. Uh, you forwarded me that article from uh, Matt Ridley uh, about um, Lucky Planet and the idea that, uh, you know, that article is mainly about the conclusion of Lucky Planet, which is uh, there are so many things that happened in order to make it possible for us to have, not so much that it made it possible to have life, but the things that made it possible for us to have an extraordinarily long uh, billions of years of relatively good weather, which is you know, astonishingly rare. Usually you'll have a brief period of good weather because as, as we mentioned last week, both Mars and Venus at various times were very Earth-like and both of them, you know, as entropy is what rules, you know, spun out of control, one going too hot, one going too cold. And it's amazing that, uh, that we've, uh, you know, been uh, where we are so long. Uh, it, it was, it was I, I liked it a lot because it went beyond the idea of, uh, the the anthropic principles 
-hmm. and not just talking about our planet but also the very rules of of our universe you know as far as you know we we have one of the premises he says is that it's not likely that we are on the best possible planet for life just because like of all the types of planets it would be very unlikely for us to have for us to happen to grow up on the very best of them so odds are we're one of the second best ones good enough that life can happen or whatever uh, same thing with our universe, the rules of our universe with the, uh, you know, how easy it is for, for, for uh, you know, information to be exchanged between, you know, DNA and cells. And it talks about the, you know, ideas I hadn't thought of, like there has to be a, ma a, a minimum temperature full stop for life to occur and a maximum temperature full stop for life to occur. Uh, because beyond that, there's no physical way for the DNA to exchange, uh, you know, self-replicating information. Uh, and uh, I, I don't know, it gave, it gave me a lot to thought about, to think about. Um, it was a little bit depressive in that one of the things it points out, and I guess it's a fact, is, you know, it is not a question of if our, and, you know, take this for what you will, there is no doubt that the climate of Earth will sour and the place will become uninhabitable. That is a full on fact that is inescapable. And when it happens, uh, you know, the question is, you know, where will we be for that? And he doesn't really address that. He just addresses how astonishingly short our window is and how we're already like 80% through the battery life of our planet. There's only a set window. And even if everything goes great and, uh, you know, no matter what you think about uh, uh, man-made climate change and its effects, you know, the fact is we have a set battery life and we're already 80% through that. Uh, which is another thing that's amazing that that we evolved to intelligent life like right under the wire. Uh, it's it, it's a bit it's a bit of a bummer, but also kind of inspiring and shocking because it just points out how unbelievably lucky we are to to be alive. We're under the wire, but we got like another billion years. So there's yes, that. well, no, 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 yeah, but but yeah. still, I mean, it's weird because oh, yeah, you, yeah. you don't think of yeah. yourself as like you know. We, you know, and that's the other thing, too, is, is you know, what's going to happen? We're talking about the massive changes and moving into space in the next 200 to 300 years. That is a nothing. That's an eye blink in the lifetime of our planet. Uh, and, and just think about this. Uh, say we're 80 years old of, out of our 100 that we're going to do. And then at the age of uh, like on our 81st birthday, in the first 30 seconds of our 81st birthday, we go from business as usual to all of a sudden being extraplanetary and and uh, you know within another 10 seconds we've expanded to half the solar system within another 10 seconds we have arcs going out to to other galaxies or whatever i mean that's that's amazing maybe not other galaxies but other star systems it, it's it's amazing when you think in those scale of terms yeah space so there we go lucky planet who do you know who wrote it uh i can look it up real quick but uh do, do you have a pick my pick is uh, I saw Godzilla. Thursday, yeah. And I absolutely loved the movie. David I, Waltham, by the way, real quick, just to finish that up. David Waltham. Wrote, author of Lucky Planet and yeah. not Godzilla's secret name. That's true. Yes. <laughs> um, I, so my pick is Godzilla. I love Godzilla. Uh, you know, there is, there is an hour before you really get to Godzilla. And I understand some people, you know, it's frustrating. For, for me, I liked it. I liked the building to it. Um, I... I think it's probably my favorite giant monster movie of all time. And where where is your what what what, what what's your top three there? Just uh, so people can get a sense of uh, where else you're at on that well, Pacific Godzilla, Rim, Cloverfield, classic King Kong, um, and that's about it. it. It, it it is it it it's it, it's a pretty specific genre, you know, like and and it's one of those that like. I don't what? think necessarily has aged uh, well as as a genre because it was so much about the spectacle of that you can do these kind of things in, in well, movies, like, which is why they were so like, popular. I mean, for example, like I went and I watched some other stuff. Like I went back and I watched Cloverfield. I love Cloverfield actually. My my only frustration with Cloverfield is the twenty minutes before the movie starts of the twenty minutes of this twenty something drama about the love lives of these people. There's literally nothing to do with the plot of the movie other than to try to make you like the characters. But for, as, a, as a writer, I'd say, yes, but you could pull us into the plot of this is a movie about a giant monster ravaging New York City. Yeah. 20 minutes of the film of the found footage have nothing to do with that at all. And, and that's to me is that is that was one of the biggest frustrating things for many people saw Cloverfield is you're 20 minutes, you're 15 minutes in, 60 minutes in going, 
when do we get to the goddamn monster? You know, it's like the Peter Jackson King Kong is, you know, it's an hour before we get to the giant monkey and, you know, there's other interesting stuff that happens there, but, the, you know, the the meat of it is... Man, that, and that, and you are, you are right. The Peter Jackson King Kong is like three hours, the first and the third, I could really do without, but like that one hour on Skull Island, like I, I really do dig. Like I, I will, I will stand up for that second hour. Everything else is like, yeah, I see. But in the in the third hour, I really dug the the, the humanizing elements of Kong and the the brief moment, you know, when he's when he's spinning around on the ice, you know, with with the cube blonde or whatever. Um, I would actually say I liked King Kong better, uh, possibly much better than Godzilla. Um, and and having said that, I think that they made I, I felt about Godzilla in many ways how I felt about uh, Star Trek Into Darkness, which is I understand why they made all the decisions they made. They were probably universally the right decisions. Having said all that, I definitely spent two thirds of the movie bored. And 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 what's funny is I like the movie more now that it's over and just a memory, just a collection of set pieces. And I could think to myself, like, wow, man, that that uh, uh, that that high altitude drop was really awesome. And the use of the 2001 soundtrack, you know, I'm glad that wasn't just in the previews. That was really haunting in that moment. I got vertigo, and you know, the 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 wrestling moves coming back. And the, the payoff at the end. Have, have you seen it yet, Justin? No. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be delicate about what we described. But certainly, that finishing move was was fairly epic. And, and uh, uh, I took, I meant to take my 10-year-old uh, because I was going to go see it with my brother. And I wanted to get uh, uh, the kids, well, at least one of the kids, out of Bonnie's hair. So Penny said she would go. <laughs> Then she watched the trailer and almost in tears calls me back saying, I don't want to watch Godzilla. I don't want to watch Godzilla. <laughs> Meanwhile, my six-year-old, Josie, was like, I think it looks cool. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, you realize like a lot of people are going to die. She's like, okay, all right. And I'm like, it's going to be crazy loud too. She's like, I'll put on these earmuffs. And then when it gets loud, I'll just do this. And I'm like, okay. And uh, So Josie went with you? She did. And she loved it. Like, there were moments that were very scary for her, and she was not a fan of all the parents that kept dying. <laughs> because, <laughs> because you know, all these vignettes, they always make sure to put a kid and some adult figure in there right before the adult gets wiped out. Uh, and But that finishing move, and I apologize, this is a visual-only gag, but the, that finishing move happened, and her eyes got wide as saucers, and she turned right to me, I'll never forget it, just like, it was like the most amazing <laughs> moment. Uh, it was. It was uh, that alone was worth it. She thought it was awesome, uh, but it, you know, I, 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 I like that they gave justifications for things. I didn't buy any of it. I, I thought it was. I'm like, oh, that's cute. They're trying to justify all this stuff. Still totally silly. And and I and I wonder if they would have been better served instead of giving me justifications, uh, making me not care what the justifications were. Because you, you know, you can invest. You only have so much time to invest in those things, and uh, and I wish they had done, you know, more of the, uh, uh, I, I don't know, uh, like King Kong was just as silly a premise, but they didn't go out of their way to explain how it's possible that King Kong could possibly be alive on this island, and then that's why we have a Kong. Like it was just like, shut up, it's a big ape. That's that's all you need to know. That that's yeah, always I, been part I, of the Godzilla story, though, right? You know, the 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 origin and and kind of it being man's sin revisited has kind of always been part of the Godzilla mythos. Well, they 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 go into the origin here is I mean, there's there's kind of various sort of the, the Godzilla origin has never been quite. There's one specific. This is where he came from, kind yeah. of thing. And here, I, I I bought it as a comic book explanation. And and you know the things. Remember, there's reason Peter Jackson set his King Kong in you know 1933 or whatever. And the, is the original time frame is because he knew trying to set it in a contemporary and like, oh yeah, there's this island that uh, NASA didn't notice that has giant animal, and which is the I kind of like the De Laurentiis '76 King Kong. I still kind of I still kind of enjoyed that movie, and and you know that tried to kind of handle that aspect of it. But I thought here, like, I, I, in, in the purpose of the movie, I believed the reality of it. I accepted it in, in the sense that when I got into it and, you know, long, long, long time ago, there were things bigger than dinosaurs. Done. Yeah. Done. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and there is, you know. Although I instantly a, thought about, like, a, well, there was 30% more oxygen back then, and, you know, that's why they could be so big. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so, and, 
which Karis Hooch is like going to go look up, you know, like what was the biggest dinosaur? We don't know what the biggest dinosaur was, but we don't, you know, we can, we can, we we find the biggest bone, which tells us, but we're not doing, you know, we don't know what's buried way, way under because of, you know, the conduction, you know, because of, you know, continents, you know, overlapping each other and what's way the hell down there and things that are super, super old and, yeah, I, I, the more I think about it, man, it's like it's like they really did come up with some and then mild spoilers ahead. I don't think it's ruining any plot points, but like they came up with decent excuses for like how can you lose a seventy foot tall or seventy meter tall monster? Well, uh, they shoot out EMPs and they keep blowing out our instruments, and so we don't know where he is. You know, which, like which you know that was like I went back and I watched the nineteen ninety eight Godzilla, mm -hmm. and you know, and it was it was frustrating because for many reasons and that's one of the things is like they lose it in new york city and they have a couple scenes where they're walking through tunnels that are like you know they're, they're, he's burrow he's like a burrower you know like oh but yes the, the the godzilla is this giant burrower but then <laughs> you know we lose him in new york city and you know we will only send helicopters out there to look and it was just like I had to like come up with a lot of reasons for that to be this where and you know on the size thing i'll say that, like this was a movie that decided to treat monsters as tornadoes or hurricanes you know yeah. decided to treat them not as big dinosaurs but as these big natural disasters sweeping across like a hurricane or whatever and so i was okay with that i'm gonna excite it did like it did super super it had you know, its box office was fantastic they're most likely going to be doing a sequel to that. I think Gareth Edwards, I enjoyed he did the movie Monsters, you know, the no budget movie with these big alien monsters. Right. And I think that for a, you know, a debut big Hollywood film, I think he did a I think he did a great job of it and I'm excited. I'm excited to see this franchise have life to it. Yeah, there's a there's a bunch of spoilery things I want to talk about that, but I'll save that for uh, for Court Killers tomorrow, yeah. but uh, but I I would say in general, liked it, didn't love it. Definitely came in second place to King Kong in in that genre in my book. Uh, Peter, Peter Jackson's, Jackson's Peter Kong Jackson's King Kong, yeah, Peter Jackson's. Uh, yeah, well, I guess I'll, I'll have to see it tomorrow because I'll I'll be on Cord Killers and I do want to discuss it. So, uh, we will uh we will we will continue that there. Uh, my pick, real quick. Uh, been on a lot of planes, haven't had a chance to watch a lot of stuff, so I've kind of uh, gotten into uh, iPhone games a little bit. Uh, Third Eye Crime is the one that I've been so excited. I'm so excited. Uh, like I'm always on the hunt for a for a time suck uh iOS oh. game. Jesus, Third I've deleted threes off of my phone three times now. <laughs> <laughs> threes is pretty great. Uh, uh all right. Third so this crime. is it, it, it's a noir crime kind of a uh, setting. It's very well done in terms of the presentation, but effectively they're all just uh stages where you have, uh, you know, you have to uh, get through these various places and uh, either get all the, you know, diamonds that you can throughout it or just get to the end of it without uh, being caught by anybody. There's all these little power ups. It's uh, this feels like it, uh, like a uh, uh, solid snake. So, 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 so solid snake. Uh, so, 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 so. Yeah, no, it is. It does. It does have a bit of a Metal Gear Solid sort of feel to it uh, in terms of uh, being able to sneak through uh you know, uh, each each level, and uh, it's got a great kind of uh, film noir detective Sam Spade sort of uh, soundtrack and feel to it. Uh, uh, I've I've enjoyed it uh, quite a bit. So that's a uh, third eye crime. Right on. Very cool. Uh, quick note: I'm going to be in New York City end of the month for Book Expo America, and I think I might be going to BookCon, which is their book convention within that. So. Dude, that's fantastic. This is all, uh, I assume, in preparation for your uh, mass market paperbacks? This is, yeah, for this is for Angel Killer. The release is going to be in September 23rd, but I'll be doing, actually be giving away copies, galley copies of it and signing them at Book Expo America. So, Congratulations, Boom. man. That's awesome. Check yeah. that out. I've got the, uh, my galley over here. So. Kind of oh, let me sh I'm just going to show you something. Here. Oh, wait, oh, wait. Uh, for, for audio listeners, we just had uh, we just had Amber, Andrew walk off camera, very excitedly digging through stuff, holding up. So what? This is the uh, this is the big the galley. Quick, now, dude, pirate this. Put that on the torrent yeah, yeah. sites. Now, now I have what's in our news, and I put in my special thanks. Um, they uh, and I, 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 it's too late to fix it. Um, 
I think Diamond Club, and I actually put the logo, and they got rid of the logo, and it just says, you know, thanks to the Diamond Club. But, oh, uh, that oh, that's awesome. great. But we're, getting, but we're getting Diamond Club is in. Dude, that's great. That's amazing. <laughs> we're immortal. So make sure you pick up your, uh, your paperback copy of... Uh, Angel Killer out this September, and make sure you go see Andrew at Book Expo and Book Con. Uh, this is at uh, the end of May, right? Yep, yep. So you can pre order that book now. It's on Amazon, elsewhere. Uh, I'm also going to be in Vegas in July. I'll talk more about that for the American Libraries Association. Right on, man. Dude, that's so great to, to, for that book to get you know, more, of, uh, more of the attention that it absolutely deserves. Yeah, well, I was glad. They're like, oh, who do you want to thank? I'm like, oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right on. I guess are we wrapping this up? Yep. Gentlemen. It's been weird. Yeah. Beauty. Um, hey, number one, real big shout out to, uh, to Cheeto, who is... Uh, the, the podcast publishing and editing squire. Oh my gosh. Uh, for, for Diamond Club. The lifeblood. Did you know that he got out the last episode of Night Attack on time despite the fact that he was in the emergency room? What? When, yeah, how dude. did I just hear about this now? Yeah, man. He, he was in. Uh, so big shout out to Cheeto. Uh, he is the best on so many levels. Can, we, can we make a little blitz on saying thanks to Cheeto on the tweets? Uh, no, definitely. I, uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I've been, I've been talking to him, so he's, uh, he's doing well now. Uh, it, everything's fine. It wasn't any kind of lingering, uh, issue, but he's the best. And we all should run. Oh, thank you, Cheeto. Yeah. Man. So all you people hating on Cheeto, uh, take, give, give it a rest. Just a break. Dude, yeah, no, he's, he's, he's so great. Him and, him and T2, T2 totally took the, you know, Night Attack, uh, publishing, you know, kind of on their, on their plate. It's to the next level, man. Um, it's over 9,000. Dude, absolutely. Uh, and actually, real quick, this might be something for, for Cord Killers. I'm sure it'll be discussed on Cord Killers tomorrow, but I do want to get Andrew's opinion on it because I know we've talked about it in the past, but it looks official, the AT&T deal for DirecTV. Um, and you know, we talk so much about science and, and kind of technological exploration, but I kind of feel like you know, with uh, who knows where Sirius XM will kind of uh, be in the next, you know, five, 10 years. But the idea of satellites as a communication method for our entertainment seems like kind we, of are, we are wrapping up. Yeah, yeah, we're wrapping up on that idea and kind of where where the, the pluses and, and minuses are on that. It, it kind of feels like now we can sort of look at that trend from a distance. I mean, yes, that's the long way around, right? So I agree that in general, that's not the preferred way I would send my bits if I could send it light speed across the ground. Uh, but I love there being more than one game in town. I love their, uh, you oh, know, if they, sure. if they could be the other guys that I can always, you know, hold against the, the first ones, then I'm down with that. Well, yeah. I mean, I guess like, well, now there will be one less if AT&T, I mean, you will have one less option in terms of, uh, in terms of buying, you know, where you get your television, uh, if, if AT&T does U-verse and stuff like that and direct TV would now be a, a different company, but it'll surely reshape stuff. Uh, but I know Andrew, we've talked a lot about how, you know, satellites even in their heyday as, as a solution for delivering content was kind of a, uh, a bit of a flawed idea. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly, they're, you know, one directional for receiving things like that, they're fine. But yeah, I'm trying to go upstream. That's problematic. I think that, you know, I, I'm, I was talking to somebody the other day about, you know, who uses a Tor browser, which always makes me a little nervous. Um, but the idea of that we're, it, it feels less and less of a hanky thing to want to kind of find these different ways to one, mask what you're doing, either to avoid you know, the intrusiveness of people, whether it be, you know, Google or the government, you know, watching what you're, you know, doing, but also getting into the idea that we're, I think we're so close to a big project, like a mesh network kind of thing that's going to be independent of, 
you know, you and know, I Google hope so. I, I, it really makes me nervous, you know, knowing how quickly, um, you know, both commercial and government interests could uh, stifle the internet at any time if they needed to. Yeah, I, I think that you know, if if finding out what we can do now with even okay. narrower amounts of bandwidth and then trying to take advantage of that, I'm, I'm I think again, I, I was thinking that we're gonna have this ten years ago, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, uh, all right. Well, Bonnie just walked in. I think we're about to do dinner, so I got to let you go, and then we're going to record some stuff for Scam School. And, all uh, right, gentlemen. It was a good chat, sirs. Adios. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. I am shutting down the feed in a moment, so just enjoy a little bit of nonsense. There. I got you playing. Oh, what? Just a That's not it. Oh. Clap, clap.